back to God's house tonight. Let's go and stand on our feet, grab your song books. Let's see number 534. Hymn number 534. No, not one. Sing it out nice and loud. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, oh, not one. None else could heal all our soul diseases. No, Pages to the left in number 511, Footprints of Jesus. We will follow the steps of Jesus wherever they go. Sing it out, church, nice and loud. Sweetly, Lord, have we heard the calling of Yeah. 
decided to follow Jesus, we've got to follow those footprints. Amen. Amen. All right. Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to gather together tonight. Thank you for uh, allowing Brother Trey, Brother Luke to be back with us, Lord. Thank you for uh, just um, your guidance and direction in our midst. And I pray that you would continue to help those that are sick. Thank you, Lord, that so many are in the recovering stage and and can be back with us soon. And I pray for those that are still sick, that you touch them, lift them up. Lord, any that may be amongst our bus children or families, that you would touch them and lift them up, uh, ones we may not know about. And Lord, I just pray that you'd bless in this service. I pray that we'd, we would have come to gather around your word to hear from you. Uh, Lord, I, it, whether it's eloquent or not, your word is still truth. And I pray that you would guide tonight and work in a tremendous way. In Jesus' precious name, amen. And amen. You all may be seated. Let me switch over here. Amen. All right. Praise the Lord. All right. I um, have been um, reminded... It's interesting, we were talking about before the service, the, the different start to the year for our church. It's just been different and uh, unexpected. It weren't just, but it's just what it was. You know, it happened. A lot of us were laid low for a while, couldn't uh, do as much as we wanted to. And, and a lot of things that we wanted to get doing, we haven't been able to get doing. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's not easy on us to... Uh, feel at times like you're spinning your wheels a little bit. Um, but you know, there's something that we can always do no matter what's going on, and that's we can pray. We can pray. And we, we treat that now as almost a, an excuse, a cop-out, a, a quick answer, a, a that's, the, that's the flip side. It's, it's an amazing thing, but when you counsel people and, 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 and you say you need to pray, it's almost like they think that's too simple of an answer. Nothing simple about prayer, first of all, because it's a spiritual battle. Right. And there's nothing small about prayer either. And it's not, an, it, prayer shouldn't be an oh, by the way. Oh, by the way, that's what we do if nothing else works. Oh, by the way, that's, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a, 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 a sideline. Oh, don't forget to pray for your food. Oh, don't forget to say a little prayer before you go to bed. Prayer ought to be a consistent and constant part of the Christian life. In fact, if we're, if we're going to be in obedience to the Word of God, the Bible says pray without what? Ceasing. Without ceasing. So we should be really in a constant attitude of prayer. Uh, we understand we can't bow our knee every minute of every day. We can't close our eyes every minute of every day. wouldn't recommend it. There are certain times when it's good to have your eyes open. Amen? Uh, but, uh, but, but there should be that... Consistent and constant. We talk a lot about how prayer is, is, is talking with God, communicating with God. Um, the, the people that I'm around the most, uh, we don't, we have specific times that we set up to talk about certain things. Like with my wife, we have certain times when we say, okay, we need to sit down and talk about this. We need to address this. And we have specific times. But you know, we just, we just talk through the day. My wife has a question. She picks up the phone, calls me, and I give her an answer. If I've got a question, I pick up the phone, and I call her, and I give her an answer. When we get home, uh, you know, we, just, we have normal communication all through the day. Though there are specific moments when you say, okay, we need to sit and talk about this. It's the same thing with the Lord. You should have specific times when you go to him in closet prayer. A church should have specific times when they are meeting with God. But we also ought to just have the attitude of prayer. You're in communication with God all the time. Not talking about that, that you're at the altar 24 hours a day, but in your heart, you, you realize you can just talk to God, right? You realize something comes into your mind, you can just talk to the Lord. You wake up thinking about somebody, pray for them. Um, Y'all ladies have dreams. You dream about somebody? Pray for them. Pray for them. You think about people? 
Pray for them. You see something happen and pray for them. Sometimes just through the day. You know, I've, I've had times when it's just something special will happen and you'll just take a moment and say, Lord, I sure am grateful for that. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. We ought to have the attitude of prayer. And uh, um, this semester in the uh, Bible Institute, I'm going to be teaching a class on prayer. And, um, and so even before I'd gotten the notes, I was beginning to just look at some things and look at some verses in the Bible studies and look at some different lessons. And, and I, I came across a lesson that I had taught, but it's been a number of years ago. It's not original to me. Uh, it's in a series of Sunday school lessons that we did uh, on the prayer life of the first century church. And uh, we did a series, uh, it's from Crown Publications, on, on the, the, uh, uh, the, the way they have the book is it's uh, um, how to be a 21st century church, and it has the 20 crossed out. And it's a, so it's how to be a first century church. And one of the lessons in there was on prayer, the prayer life of the first century church. And um, prayer has almost become secondary in our churches today. It's, it's a part of the service. I've seen situations where prayer is basically just used as a transition. So that everybody bows their heads and they can move singers around or they can move things around. They can do it. And there's no real, it's just like a transition thing. Um, I, I've seen it where uh, it's, it's talked about, but not necessarily done. And... Um, we, we talk a lot about wanting the power that that first church had, the, the, the progress that that first church had, that the, the, the uh, 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 growth of the first century church and the, the things that they saw, you saw happening in that first century church. Um, but we don't always want to do or face the same things that the first century church faced or did. One of the things that they did was they prayed. They prayed. And it began while the Lord Jesus Christ was here on earth. He taught those disciples how to pray. And then, and I, I've been working on a message, but the Lord just, it's not, it's not completed. Um, it's, but there's a, there's a prayer, what I consider the, the, the true Lord's prayer. is a prayer that the Lord Jesus prays for his disciples. Uh, in the book of John. And it's a tremendous prayer. But there's some stuff in there that I'm still getting my head around. That's why I haven't preached the message yet. But the Lord Jesus not only taught them how to pray. He showed them how to pray. And he prayed for them. And they carried that over into the first century church. Or church is of the first century and so let's go to Acts chapter number one tonight as we look at this subject of the prayer life of a church. It says the prayer life of the first century church, but it ought to be our prayer life. It ought to be how churches are today. And in the book of Acts chapter number one, There's some things about Acts chapter 1 that have always amazed me. One is, um, this is of course shortly after the Lord Jesus Christ had gone to the cross, was buried, was rose again. Um, and after he had encouraged the discouraged disciples, the fearful disciples, after he had uh, uh, reconciled, if you want to say it that way, with with uh, doubting Thomas and with Peter who had denied him and the guilt that he felt and he, he reaffirmed with them their call to not be fishers for regular fish but to be fishers of men. And so, you know, this is the, this is the, the, the peak uh, of, of, I mean, <laughs> they know that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again. They had seen him walk through walls to be with them. Or, or, or at least just was in their midst. Uh, and, and they're afraid when that happened. But then, then the joy that they had. I mean, I mean they are, you, you, if you want to say things, this was, 
you would consider that they were at the peak of their fire when it comes to, I mean, I, I just can imagine that they were champing at the bit after all that with them going back to fishing and everything, wondering what's the Lord going to do next. And you know what the Lord did next? He left them. He left them. But before he left them, he gave them their marching orders. And what was their marching orders? Go ye into all the world, preach the gospel. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. And ye shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, in Jerusalem, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the earth. He gives them their marching orders. So the, the, the work of salvation is done. Jesus has completed what he's going to do here. He has commissioned those disciples to continue on the work that he began here on earth. I mean, it is, it is go time, right? Not yet. Not yet. Because look at Acts chapter 1, verse 10 through 14, and it says, And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up for you into heaven, shall so come in like manner, as ye have seen him go into heaven. Then returned they unto Jerusalem for the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey, and began to run up and down the streets proclaiming the gospel. Nope. Nope. Verse 13, And when they were come in, they went up into an upper room where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon Zealots and Judas the brother of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and with his brethren. Uh, by the way, I, this is just, uh, uh, maybe it's just my little warped way of seeing things in it. It says that all those guys abode in that upper room. I don't think I'd want to meet in that upper room. Uh, but, uh, uh, but that's where they met. Uh, you know, they, uh, uh, we already know they had dirty feet because the Lord Jesus washed them. You know, they, they, they weren't good at keeping their, 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 their feet, even their feet washed. But, uh, um, but they, they were there together and they were told by the Lord Jesus Christ, wait for the promise of the Father which saith ye have heard of me, for John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. They went back, and before they ever went to preaching, before they ever went to proclaiming, before they ever went to doing any of that, they went into prayer. And it says there, they continued how? With one accord. They were a unified church, a unified group of believers. Those that would come together to meet with them, the 120 that would come together and meet with uh, James and John and, and Peter and all the disciples, they were a unified group. And do you see how they began their ministry after the Lord Jesus Christ, they in obedience to God, they went to prayer. Do we believe prayer really matters? I understand we're people of action. And I understand that, that, that the gospel has to have shoe leather. Be how beautiful are the feet of them that spread the good news. I get that. I get that we got to put shoe leather to what we believe but if we are going to be as effective, and by the way, did they put shoe leather to the gospel? Oh, yes, they did. But they also knew they needed power from on high. They needed that unity of the church, and they needed to pray. They needed to get before the Lord and pray. In fact, you see in the church of the first century that they had different types of meetings. They had meetings where the gospel was preached. They had meetings where the gospel was taught. But we also see that they had prayer meetings together. This isn't the only time they met together to pray. This isn't the only time that they got together to pray. They believed in prayer in the first church. And they believed in praying properly. Look at Ephesians 5.20. Ephesians 5.20. Ephesians 5.20 says this. 
Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. They prayed and they prayed in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why do we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? He alone is our authority and our power. Who sent the Holy Spirit? Jesus Christ sent the Holy Spirit. Who does the Holy Spirit always represent? Not himself, the Lord Jesus Christ. It is in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that we have power and we have authority. How could these ignorant and unlearned men preach and teach with authority? Because they were covered with the authority and power of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they were filled with the Holy Ghost. And they were bathed in prayer. We talk about those flames coming down upon them in Acts chapter 2, right? But where were they? They were in the, met together as a church, and what were they doing? They're in one accord in prayer. Prayer matters. Prayer is important. And I understand we're supposed to have, uh, uh, I, I've, I've known people in the past who didn't want to come on Wednesday night because we prayed together publicly, and they just believed it should be done in private. I believe in the secret closet of prayer. But I also believe in public prayer. Because it is all through the New Testament. It was in the Old Testament with the Jewish people. And it's all through the New Testament with the church. Public prayer. Are there things that should be kept in the secret closet of prayer? Absolutely. Should you take things to God in the secret closet of prayer? Yes. Is the public forum of the church an opportunity for you to share all of your every burden you have or, or to uh, uh, reveal all of the complaints that you have or to talk about all the people that you wish God would strike? No. Are there things that are supposed to be in the secret closet of prayer? Absolutely. But that doesn't negate also the importance of churches that get together and pray together and get on their knees before God together. And it doesn't mean that that should take precedence over the uh, uh, over preaching. But preaching also doesn't need to take precedence over prayer. They can work together. And a church can have the preaching it needs, but it also needs prayer. It needs prayer. And in that first century church, they declared here in this passage their absolute dependence upon God. They could not do what God had commanded them to do without God. God had given them a big job. You realize that they were supposed to reach all of the known world, right? Go ye into all the world. I mean, that was a big job. And we talk about it being a big job today. I understand the population is a lot bigger. I get that. But we also have a lot bigger ways to communicate as well. I mean, we've got so many different ways to communicate. There's, there's radio broadcast going into countries tonight that are close to the gospel. But that radio broadcast is getting in there. There are still areas of the world where radio is a big thing. There's, there are... Uh, uh, there are, it's an amazing how uh, from behind the Iron Curtain when it fell, how there were Bibles in Russia. There were churches in Russia. God's word can penetrate even Iron Curtains. God's word can penetrate into the darkest places of this world that we think are impossible to reach, but it's going to take spirit-filled, bathed in prayer, Christians and churches. Oh, we'll never be able to reach Harlingen. Who says? Us? Are we the ones that say that? Because as far as I know, the Bible still says go into all the world. Right? The Bible still says Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, right? The Bible still deals with that. It can be done, but a church must have its complete dependence upon God. I'm not against programs. Not against them. I think that there is, there's a, the Bible talks about administrations in the church, right? Uh, the, there, I, I have no problem with programs. I have no problem with order. 
I have no problem with promotions. But if we're depending upon that to do the work of God, we're missing the point. Our dependence is upon the Lord. And how do we tap into the power of God? It's through prayer. Through prayer. It's amazing how, you know what? I don't, and I don't know. I don't know. The Bible is, doesn't tell us what they did every day between the day that the Lord Jesus went back. And they, we don't have a, a, a minute by minute accounting of what they did. But what's amazing about this is you don't really see them having preaching meetings. What did they have? Prayer meetings. They met together to pray, to seek the face of God. Once again, we're not taking this to an extreme that that minimizes preaching. Preaching matters. Preaching is important. I think you need to build your services on preaching, but you also need to have time of prayer and there's nothing wrong with a church just meeting together and praying for what God wants. Praying for the power of God. Praying for God to work in a tremendous way. They declared the dependence on God and waited on him for the answer. I personally think they got a little anxious when they chose the 12th disciple. Because I, I personally believe that Paul was supposed to be the 12th disciple. Uh, there, in, in, in heaven, there isn't 13. There's 12, right? And Paul is a legitimate apostle, right? Yes. And another thing is, is we don't really hear much about that other guy after that. I'm not saying he was a bad guy. I believe he served the Lord. But I think they got a little bit ahead of God. I don't think it was God's will. Here they were praying for the power of God, and they're casting lots about who's going to take the place of you know, of, of Judas. But overall, they were saying, we are going to believe what the Lord Jesus said. We're going to wait for him to answer. And by the way, when they finally got the answer in Acts chapter 2, did they not do a work that was way beyond them? Yes. You really think that when they went out that day, they went, I think 3,000 people are going to get saved today. By the way, there was probably more that got saved. That was just the ones that were baptized. You know, that was a time when there was people from all different places, right? There may have even been more that got saved. And who knows how many countless thousands were saved out of those 3,000 that were baptized and added to the church. But you really think that they said, you know what? I think that our church is going to go from 120 to 3,120 today. You really think they felt that way? No, that was a work way beyond them. Do you really think that they left that room going, you know what, when I preach, they're going to hear me in a bunch of different languages. You really think that they believe that? Up to that point, tongues wasn't the thing, right? And I'm not talking about modern tongues. I'm talking about biblical tongues. But it wasn't a thing, right? right. Up to that point, that was something that God gave them then. I don't believe that they sat there and went, you know, let's go to the Lord in prayer because we really need to pray because I'm going to speak in a bunch of languages today and there's going to be 3,000 people added to the church. No, they didn't know what God was going to do. All they knew was they were supposed to wait for the tarry and wait for the power of God, for the Holy Spirit. And when, But when he showed up and they just depended on the Lord and waited for his answer, when he showed up, when he showed up, Amazing things happened. I want this to be a church like that. I need to be a pastor that believes in this. And y'all need to be church folks that believe that we, if we depend upon the Lord, greater things than we could ever imagine can happen. The first century church declared its absolute dependence and waiting upon God. The statement that the writer puts here is we never waste time waiting on God. We feel like it's a waste of time, right? And by the way, this doesn't mean that we're just supposed to go sit around and go, well, I'm just waiting. You've heard the story about the guy when the flood was coming, right? Have you all heard that story? Anybody not heard that story? 
<laughs> Only one person. All right. Anybody out there on Facebook not seen it before? Let me see. Oh, nobody's answering. Uh, but uh, you remember the guy that's praying for, for oh, the flood water's coming up, so he play, prayed for somebody to rescue. And, you know, here comes a trooper, knocks on the door, says, uh, oh, I'm, uh, I'm here to help you get out. Nope, nope, I'm waiting for God. Then later the water starts coming up and they got to go to the second floor and here comes a boat. You know, come on, get in the boat. Wait, wait. No, no, but wait for God. Finally, he had to get up on the roof. Here comes a helicopter. We could drop a rope down. No, no, I'm waiting on the Lord. So he dies. Gets to heaven. Ask the Lord. I don't understand. I was waiting on you to rescue me. He said, I sent you a trooper, a boat, and a helicopter. What more did you want? Sometimes that's how we act as Christians, right? Yeah. I'm just waiting on the Lord. That's not what waiting is. Wait, you, you're supposed to serve the Lord. You're supposed to serve the Lord. You're supposed to serve Him. But there are also times when we run ahead of God. And that's when we need to wait for the Lord. And not get impatient when he doesn't give us the answer, the moment we want that answer. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he will strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. So we're supposed to wait on the Lord. So they waited for the Lord. The first century church also looked to the Lord for laborers. Matthew chapter number 9. Matthew chapter number 9. What had the Lord told them to do? What had the Lord told them to do? Matthew chapter number nine. Matthew chapter number nine, verse number 37, 38. Then saith he unto his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Imagine that. Even back then, the laborers were few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. You say, did they do that? Well, it does say that uh, at the church at Antioch, there were preachers and teachers there, right? And that when they were praying, what did the Holy Spirit do? It said, separate unto me Paul and Barnabas, right? Mm -hmm. And so they separated them and sent them out. God wants us to depend upon him even for laborers. Now we should encourage, we should challenge, we should help people to get involved in the work of the Lord. But how many times do we pray for more laborers? We complain about there not being enough laborers. But how many times do we pray for more, for more laborers? How many times do we pray for people to fill places in the church? How many times do we pray for more people to come out and knock doors with us? How many times do we pray for more Sunday school teachers? Pray for more singers. Pray for more young men in the church to rise up and preach and teach and be a part of things. And young ladies, the same thing. How often do we pray for laborers? The first century did. We ought to depend upon the Lord. We ought to wait upon the Lord. We ought to pray that God would send forth laborers now, we need to be about busy about the work of going out and bringing people to Christ and getting them into church, getting them baptized, getting them discipled. But then out of those, we need to ask God, raise up laborers. Raise up laborers. The first century church came together as one body in agreement through prayer. Matthew chapter number 18. Matthew chapter number 18. Matthew chapter number 18, verse number 19 and 20. Again, I say to you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. What are we supposed to do? We should come together in agreement. It's very interesting, but in reading about, there have been, great revivals through the centuries. And there were some tremendous revivals, late 1800s, early 1900s, in Asia, through Korea, and different areas. 
and reading about different revivals, one of the things that you saw happening that would spark many times revival is when people that were at odds with each other came together in the church. When people got things right and together and the church began to walk together to have the same, look, we're always going to have disagreements, right? We're humans. We have different personalities. We have different ways of thinking. We have different things. But what we don't differ on is the cause of Christ. What we don't differ on is the call of Christ. What we don't differ on is the commission of Christ. Those things we don't differ on. A church, you can have little disagreements on, on human level things, but when it comes to the work of God, God's people need to march together. And part of that is coming together in agreement in prayer. Agreement in prayer. You may not agree on the colors of the wall. We ought to agree on the purpose of the church. Amen. We ought to agree on the message. We ought to agree on the word of God. We ought to agree on the things that are biblical and come together. You just look at the Lord Jesus' disciples and you know that they didn't always agree. There were some hard-headed people in there. You ever, you ever heard that? Boy, that person's just really hard-headed. You know what's interesting? Probably all of us have had that said about us at one time or another. We're all head hard-headed, right? We're all stubborn in one way or another. We all dig our heels in on something. We all have these things. We all, there may be small things that we, we don't come to agreement on, but I will tell you this, a church that's united in its direction and where it wants to go and what the purpose is, that church that will come together in prayer God can use one body that's in agreement in prayer. We start to fight with each other and be separated on things, or you begin to have people pulling different directions when it comes to the mission of the church, you're going to struggle. And by the way, it's hard to pray together when you have those struggles. It's hard to pray together. The first century church sought God's protection through prayer. Look at Matthew chapter 26, verse 41. Matthew 26, verse 41. What did the Lord Jesus tell Peter? And uh, I know he was talking, the other disciples were there, but notice how he addressed Peter. Because he knew what Peter was fixing to face, right? Peter was going to deny him. Peter's the one that said, if everybody else, everybody else leaves, I'll be there. Lord Jesus said, no. Peter couldn't even watch for one hour. And he says this. Verse 41, watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Do you realize that we ought to be praying for ourselves, but also praying for each other, that we would stand strong in face of temptation? You ought to pray for your brothers and sisters that God would protect them, that God would keep them. Uh, 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 in, in fact, the Lord Jesus in that prayer in John, he doesn't talk about, he talks about, he, he didn't pray that nothing bad would ever happen to him, but he did pray that they would not uh, 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 talk about, that they would not uh, uh, become a part of the evil, or that the evil would not, uh, um, I can't remember exactly how it's worded, and I don't want to word it wrong, but it's, it's basically he was praying for them when they face temptation, when we face the wicked attacks of the devil. I'm here to tell you this. We need to be praying. You realize that every single person here and every single person uh, watching and all of those bus kids out there and the families that come in and the people that come to church, do you realize that every day we face temptation? You realize every week those kids go to school, they face temptation? Every day we face it. And what we ought to be doing as a church is praying for each other that God would help us, protect us, keep us from the evil. The first century church depended upon the Lord, waited upon the Lord in prayer. The first century church prayed for labors. First century church came together as one body in agreement in prayer 
First century church sought God's protection through prayer. The first century church had increased faith and enlarged vision through prayer. Go to Acts chapter number 4. Go to Acts chapter number 4. Acts chapter 4, verse 23 to 29. And being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voices to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them is, who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ for of a truth against thy holy child, Jesus, whom thou hast anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word by stretching forth thine hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of the holy child Jesus. Oh, do you see how when they were threatened with don't speak anymore in Jesus' name, they were threatened, they went back to the church and they got together and prayed, and they didn't pray that God would protect them in their little gathering. They said, give us more boldness. Show yourself even more powerful. Reveal yourself through mighty signs. I think sometimes in this day and age, we just kind of have resigned ourselves. Well, that's the way God used to do things. That's the way God used to do things. Do you really think that the time that the disciples were being used by the Lord Jesus Christ in that first church, you think that was an optimal time for Christianity? You think the Romans were friendly to the Christians? You think the, the, the Jewish religious leaders were friendly to the Christians? You think that it was a, a more moral time? You know, it was a very immoral time at that time. It was a time full of idolatry. It was a time full of wickedness. The nation of Israel was in chaos. The religious leaders wanted them dead. Here they're even threatening them and saying, never speak in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ again. And what did they do? What did they say? Verse 29, that with all boldness we may speak thy word. What did they say in verse 30? By stretching forth thine hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child, Jesus. Let's not become resigned to this is it. And this is all, and there's nothing else that can happen, and we're never going to do much more than this. It's over. It's not over till the trumpet sounds. You say, oh, the United States is against us, the government's against us, the people are against us. Oh, it's turning upside down. We're not the first Christians to live in bad societies. In fact, well, there are a lot of Christians who have lived with a whole lot less Religious freedom than we have even today. That's right. And doing great things for God. You do know there's great works for God going on in this world, right? Uh -huh. Great works for God. We ought to be a church that comes together and prays and asks God to increase our faith and enlarge our vision. They looked to heaven and said, Thou art God. Did you see that in verse 24? When they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, Thou art God, which made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is. We still serve the God that's powerful enough to create this world, right? That's right. He hasn't gotten less powerful. He spoke the world into existence. You realize if the world didn't exist today, he could speak it into existence again? He's got that power. He hasn't, his arm isn't shortened. His strength isn't weakened. He's still the same God, but we're gonna have to, as a church, just come to him and ask for increased faith and enlarged vision 
together as a church. They face great trials through prayer. In Acts chapter number 12 is when Peter was thrown into prison. James was killed. Peter was thrown into prison. And you know what the church did? Now they prayed like a lot of American Christians. Not really believing that God was going to answer. But they still prayed. They did more than we did. At least got together. When they threw Peter into jail, it says that prayer was made continually for him. And I don't know if that means that everybody just stayed awake for however many hours. I don't know if they, they prayed in groups. I don't know. All I know is this. The Bible says that prayer was made continually for Peter when he was in prison. By the church. That's right. And all I know is that when he got out, and I don't know what time exactly. I mean, it, it does specify a little bit what time, but it wasn't early when he got out. And they were together. They were together. In prayer. I love that story. When the girl goes to the door and sees him and slams the door in his face and runs back. I can see him just standing out there going, it's me, Pete. Bam. Hey, Peter's out there. Nah, sit down. Go get a cookie. No, he's really out there. All right, I'll go check. Just because you said, just to make you be quiet, it's actually Peter. You know, I heard a preacher say this once. He said, man, God helped him walk through the walls of a prison and he got locked out of church. <laughs> I thought that was pretty funny. <laughs> God helped him walk out of prison, walk, helped him walk out of prison doors and he got locked out of church. Uh, but uh, <laughs> it's the truth, isn't it? That's so funny. But, uh, but, but the church... They faced their great trials through prayer. They didn't snip and they didn't look for who's at fault. They just got together and said, let's pray. Peter's in jail. Let's pray. They didn't petition the governor. They petitioned the God of heaven. And the first century church sought God for opportunity to get out the gospel through prayer. And we're here at the beginning of the year. It's just kind of like been a, almost like a little spinning a little bit. And I, one of the things that Lord's been turning my heart to is, um, you know, we're going to have to learn to live with this. It's probably not going away. And I've just been asking the Lord, Lord, help us to find a way to get the gospel out there. Just help us. We understand the health and there's been people that have been sick. We get that. We, we do understand all that. But long-term speaking, we still got to keep reaching people. And sometimes we sit and we, you know, oh, well, this or that or the other thing. or ah, blah, blah, blah. You know what we're going to have to do? We're going to have to pray. God, open the doors. God, show us the way. God, do what needs to be done. In Colossians 4, they asked for that God, asked for prayer that God would open them a door of utterance. You know what we need to do? Ask God to open us a door of utterance. They were a praying church, folks. You know what we need to be? A praying church. There's a lot to pray for. It's a simple invitation. It's just to simply come and say, Lord, help us to be a praying church. We'll have time to pray for things after. But in the invitation, and, and, and once again, we always talk about how the church is not a building, right? Thank God for the building, the house of God where we can meet. But the church is what? People. And the Bible doesn't say there has to be a lot. The Bible says where? Two, Two or three are gathered in his name. Now, do we want a lot? Absolutely. Would I love to have 200 or 300? Absolutely. Let's build another building. I'm good with that. Amen. Not necessarily the building project, but I'm, I'm good with that. Amen. But uh, that, that's kind of an inside joke because anybody that's gone through a building program knows it's, it's, uh, it's something. But uh, um, I talked to a pastor that went through a big remodeling 
uh, a project a couple of years ago, and I remember talking to him one day, and he said, I'm so ready for it to be over. Uh, but, uh, but he praises the Lord that it's done now. But, but, uh, uh, but, but, but you, do real, you do realize that God's not dependent upon our numbers in prayer. He just wants us to come together and pray. He says he'll be in the midst. So in this invitation, it's real simple. Just come and say, Lord, help our church to be a praying church. And if we're going to be a praying church, then we have to pray. So come to the altar. Say, God, help us to be a praying church. And help me to be one of the praying members. Can't just be me, though I need to pray. Can't just be me got to be all of us pray seeking God's face here together when we're at home when we think about just praying and seeking God's face and so I open the altar no music tonight folks to just come and say God help us to become a praying church and help me to become a praying church member a praying church time you need. There's no rush. There's no rush. You take the time you need. Y'all may be seated. Take the time you need. There's no rush. There's no rush. We're going to dismiss Facebook Live. We're going to go into a time of prayer here. I would ask the church members that are watching from home, spend some time right now in prayer for your church people that you can think of, the ministries you can think of, just pray. Pray for what the Lord lays on your heart. You dismiss Facebook Live, and then we'll go into a time of prayer.